Let us pray. Heavenly Father, speak to us this morning through your word. Make, give us ears to hear to, and minds to comprehend what is on your heart for us today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. When I think about who I am in Christ, I recall my first trip to the Holy Land in June of 2001. Now, I was not on a tour. I was invited by Brother Andrew. Many of you know him as God Smuggler. And he informed me that we were not going to see dead stones, but living stones. We were specifically going to visit Christians from an Arab background in Israel, West Bank, and Gaza. Well, the first Saturday we were there, it was Sabbath, and the streets of Jerusalem were empty, and I drove Brother Andrew down to Gaza, where we would be speaking three times at Gaza Baptist Church. That, by the way, is the only evangelical church in Gaza Strip. At the time, there were about 2,000 Christians among 1.2 million Muslims. Today, there are actually less than 1,000 Christians among 1.6 million Muslims. Brother Andrew's mission, whenever he was in areas hostile to Christianity, was to seek out his Christian brothers and sisters and encourage them. The verse that he based that on, Revelation 3.2, was his calling, strengthen what remains and is about to die. And in Gaza, the church was and is literally at the point of death. In fact, may I su suggest to you that the next time you see any new news from Israel and Gaza, that you pray for the Christians that are caught in that conflict. But what I didn't realize as we were driving down the coast of the Mediterranean Sea is that Brother Andrew had a second objective, and that was to reach out to those who are hostile to Christians and to Israel and to the West. After we parked at the Erez checkpoint and walked into Gaza, we were driven to the campus of Islamic University where we met a man named Mahmoud Zahar. Now Mahmoud is a medical doctor, co-founder of the university, but most significant, he is the last surviving founder of a group called Hamas. No doubt you've heard of Hamas, a fundamentalist Islamic group that is determined to eliminate the nation of Israel and establish in its place a pan-Arab state. What you may not know is that for years, Brother Andrew had met and befriended members of Hamas and Mahmoud was his primary contact. Just a couple of years earlier, Dr. Zahar had invited Andrew to actually lecture at Islamic University on what is real Christianity. Now, needless to say, I was rather uncomfortable going into this meeting. Until that trip, I had thought of Hamas. Whenever I thought of them, I thought of them as nameless, faceless terrorists. Well, this meeting changed that. For over an hour, Brother Andrew and Dr. Zahar talked about the current conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, the failure of the Camp David meetings with President Clinton, Ehud Barak, and Yasser Arafat, and more. Brother Andrew also clearly expressed his Christian perspective on the conflict, which Mahmoud understood and acknowledged. As the meeting was winding down, Brother Andrew turned and asked me if I wanted to ask Mahmoud a question. Now, just the previous week, Hamas had attacked a nightclub in Tel Aviv. 21 people, mostly teenage girls, were killed. So, with fear and trepidation, I asked Dr. Zahar, doesn't the Quran forbid the killing of innocent civilians? Yes, Mahmoud agreed that it does. So, I asked, how then can Hamas justify the attack on a nightclub, killing 21 mostly teenagers? Dr. Zahar leaned forward and told me those weren't innocent civilians. Those were enemy combatants 
Listen, he said, every teenager in Israel, when he or she turns 18, is required to serve two years in the military, and afterwards they remain on reserve duty until they're 50. Those were not innocent civilians. That was a legitimate military target. Now, I must admit, I was shocked by his perspective. But that conversation was also a revelation to me, and it connects to our epistle reading this morning. If you have your Bibles, maybe you would like to turn and follow with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Reading, we see Paul says, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. Now, for many years, I assumed that Paul was referring to himself as an ambassador, and perhaps a few others like Peter and John or the other disciples of Jesus. But after meeting Mahmoud Zahar, and later on that same trip, starting a relationship with the leader of Islamic Jihad in Gaza, I had a revelation. Brother Andrew and I were serving as ambassadors for Christ. And looking again at this passage, I want us to notice how often Paul uses the pronoun we, referring not just to himself, but to his readers. The point I want us to catch this morning, all of us are called to be ambassadors. Let's go back to verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. All of us have a calling to represent Jesus Christ in this world. What does that mean? Now, we know in the United States, we have ambassadors in most countries of the world. And most countries send their ambassadors to, the United, to Washington, D.C., an ambassador is a high-ranking official chosen by a country's leader, be it its king, president, or prime minister, to go to a foreign country and represent that nation's interests. They could be a person that has spent many years in foreign service or a wealthy friend of the president who helped fund his campaign. And the ambassadorship is a payoff. But his or her purpose is to maintain or improve relations between nations. Ambassadors may sometimes convey tough messages, not their own opinion, but tough messages in an effort to avoid maybe a more serious conflict. Now, we know that Paul had a somewhat strained relationship with the Corinthians. In his first letter, he dealt with some serious problems, divisions within the church, sexual immorality, lawsuits between believers, and more. In this, his second epistle, Paul's main message is reconciliation. Verse 18 of chapter 5, this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So that involves more than simply explaining to others what God has done in Christ. It requires an active participation in the messiness of life. Paul is, also, is emphatic about reconciliation because the Corinthians are all citizens of one kingdom. Now, we know that there was division between Jews and Gentiles, between Rome and the nations they conquered, but Paul is saying that we are first citizens of heaven. That should alter our perspective. If we identify ourselves first with our earthly nationality, we will prioritize that nation's culture and politics. But if God's kingdom is uppermost, then God's agenda must govern our words and actions. In case you haven't noticed, we are dwelling in hostile territory, in a culture that is often at odds with the agenda of our monarch, King Jesus. We are called to make the agenda of our king, the first priority of our lives. Eugene Peterson wrote, God elected a people as a kingdom of priests to be a light to the people, witnesses showing and telling the ways of God to the whole earth 
welcoming everyone we meet to join the company. And that includes Islamic extremists and any others who don't view the world the way we do through our relationship with Christ. This morning, I would like to propose briefly three responsibilities that we have as ambassadors of Christ. First, as ambassadors, we must know and understand our home country, our king, and our culture. Second, we must maintain constant and secure communications with headquarters. And third, we must clearly represent and communicate our king's message. Let's examine each in a little bit of more detail. First, we need to understand our kingdom and our ruler. Our Old Testament reading this morning, God answers Job's many questions by saying, who is it that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? God then presents a series of questions and observations about the world he created. And in Job 42, in Job responds, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. The point is that Job realizes he doesn't really know the God of whom he speaks so much about. The solution, he needs to spend a lot more time getting to know and learning who God is. But it's not just knowledge about God, but also our experience with God. In Psalm 107 that we read from this morning, the very first verse Two verses begin, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble. The psalm then has four testimonies. We recited, recited this morning the fourth one, but the first testimony is of people who are lost, wandering in desert wastes. They cry to the Lord and he delivers them from their distress and leads them to the city. This testimony ends with a statement, that God satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things. The second testimony speaks of prisoners, those in affliction, because they have rebelled against the words of God. They too cry to the Lord and are delivered. The third testimony is of fools afflict, afflicted because of their sinful ways. They cry to the Lord and are healed. And the last testimony that we read this morning is from those caught in a storm. They think they're going to die. They too cry to the Lord and are rescued. All four of these testimonies reveal people who have experienced God's salvation and provision. When we can give testimony like this, we bring glory to our Lord, and that is a powerful resource for an ambassador. One more point to understand is that our citizenship is expressed uh, in a very interesting way. Let me read from Romans 8, 15 to 17. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children and heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Which means... We are not just civil servants in God's kingdom. We are members of the royal family. Our king sends out family members as his ambassadors. Now, the second thing we need as ambassadors is a hotline to headquarters. Kingdom business is urgent business. We need to report what we see in here, and we need instructions on how to re represent our king's interests in this world. I happen to enjoy reading spy thrillers. And I often read uh, a scene in which an agent in another country must contact the office back home. And the key is he has to have a secure line so to be sure that no hostile ears are listening in. Ambassadors absolutely need that sense that they can speak freely and openly to their leader. Well, that's exactly what God has provided to us as ambassadors. We have an absolutely secure line directly to our heavenly king. It's called prayer. It's a two-way communication link. We can ask questions, request resources, but we also need to listen to instructions. 
Andrew Murray has written, prayer is not a monologue, but a dialogue. God's voice in response to mine is its most essential part. And we do that, first of all, by reading the Bible, spending time in the scriptures to hear what God has to say to us. Jesus himself demonstrated how this works in Mark chapter 1, verses 35 to 38, when Jesus gets up long before dawn, goes to a remote location, and spends time with his father. The disciples come looking for him, and they report there is a crowd eager to meet him. They have an agenda for Jesus, but Jesus has orders from headquarters. Let us go to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came. So that's how our hotline works. Listen to what Jesus says. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. What an incredible resource. We don't need to rely on our own skill. God provides us with his Holy Spirit and we can get whatever insight we need in any situation where we are representing our king. That hotline is never cut. And I can tell you that when Brother Andrew and I were meeting with Mahmoud Sahar of Hamas, I had one ear on the conversation and the other ear tuned towards heaven. I was most certainly praying throughout that entire meeting. Our third responsibility is that as ambassadors, we must relay God's message, not our own opinions. And what is that message? Paul explains it in our passage in 2 Corinthians 5. Let's begin at verse 13, 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, Christ in Christ, God is reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. That was the first message that Brother Andrew delivered to Hamas, how they might know forgiveness of sin and have a relationship with God. Andrew preached that to Hamas at a refugee camp in Lebanon, and then in a series of meals in West Bank and Gaza, and finally in his lecture on real Christianity at the Islamic University. During my trip with Brother Andrew, I met several Muslims and realized they really have no understanding of this message of reconciliation. The ones that I met were very devout and faithfully obey the five pillars of Islam, but they had no assurance that God would accept them into his presence. They are lost because they have no understanding of what Christ accomplished for them on the cross. There is also a second part to this message of reconciliation, and that is our relationship with one another and with others. We are to be reconciled to God and reconciled to each other. This is not a political agenda, but rather the healing of broken relationships. I witnessed this on that same trip in a meeting between Palestinians who are Christians brought together with Jewish followers of the Messiah. They, a number of these groups over the years have come together in three-day encounters where they get to know each other. In fact, most of them had never met someone from the other side. One of the passages of scriptures they used in their time together is from Ephesians chapter 2, where Paul writes, Remember that at one time you Gentiles were separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. So Arabs and Jews are encouraged to experience the peace of God 
Once they were enemies, now they are brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what we as ambassadors of Christ do. We deliver the message that God has reconciled us to himself through the cross, and through the cross has brought peace to people who were once enemies. Unfortunately, I don't see a lot of Christians taking seriously their role as ambassadors. I wonder if that's because we are afraid of what people might think. I know I never considered going to the enemies of Israel and the West and speaking with them. But my friend, Brother Andrew, told me after that meeting with Dr. Zahar, Al, you will never lead enemies to Christ. You can only lead friends to Christ. As ambassadors, we make friends with enemies of God in order to bring them the message that God loves them and longs for them to be reconciled to him. Now, that does not necessarily mean that they will accept our message. To my knowledge, Mahmoud Zahar never believed the gospel message Brother Andrew gave him. However, that is not our responsibility. Ambassadors invite, but they cannot compel. Ambassadors are responsible for fulfilling the orders to the leadership back home. We appeal to people, but we also pray because we know that only God can change hearts. So, how can we apply this today? I would suggest one more important point in our examination of ambassadorship, and it's in verse 21 of our passage. For our sake, he, God, made him, Jesus, to be sin who know no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is where we as ambassadors of Christ are very different from ambassadors of this world. The big difference is that our King, our Lord, actually resides in us. Paul in Galatians writes, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. That is how we become the righteousness of God. I was reminded of that after the meeting with the Hamas leader. Brother Andrew said to me, and he said to me on a number of occasions, Al, you and I may be the only Jesus this man ever meets. That is why I pray that every Muslim in this city, in this country, and in the world will have a chance to meet at least one person in whom Jesus dwells. We want everyone from every race, religion, and background to hear the gospel message. We also want them to meet Jesus and see what he is like. That's our responsibility as ambassadors, to show people what Jesus looks like. So this morning, I want to issue an invitation. Are you willing to be an ambassador for Christ? You can be that with your neighbor, with your coworker. But keep in mind, it may be with someone totally unexpected. God may call you to go to someone you would never seek out on your own initiative. Perhaps your political opposite, a person who opposes everything you consider important. If God opens that door for you, go in obedience, make friends, but first make sure you know your king. Be a person of prayer connected to headquarters, listening for instructions and study this book so that you know the message that God wants us to deliver. I won't pretend that this is an easy assignment. The word ambassador in our epistle is used only one other time in the New Testament, and that's in Ephesians chapter 6, when Paul was in prison. Now, ambassadors generally are exempt from persecution in the country they're in. But that's not true of us as an ambassadors for Christ. Let me close with this verse from Ephesians 6. Paul has just written that we are engaged in a spiritual conflict against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Paul then tells us to take up the full armor of God and get in battle. Prayer is that battle. 
And Paul asks his readers to pray for him. He is in prison as he writes that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. I think that's a good prayer for all of us as ambassadors for Christ. May we declare boldly the gospel. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you have adopted us into your family and that you have sent us as your ambassadors into a world in rebellion against you. Teach us, Lord, how to faithfully represent your love and your message. And may the world see Jesus in each one of us as we serve as your ambassadors. Amen.